All right, we're going to jump right in uh, to the message this morning. And the very first thing I want you to know as we're jumping in here is um, how many of you recognize this little pink spoon from Baskin Robbins? Okay, what I want you to know is that you are a spoon. And so am I. Because what happens is when you go into a Baskin Robbins or pretty much any ice cream shop for that matter, you can walk in and you can look at all the different flavors that they have and there's some very uh, in interesting ones in there. Uh, but, but you can actually have them give you a, a sample of the ice cream before you commit to purchasing it, before you commit to buying it. And, and what they do is they give you a, a preview, a foretaste of the ice cream before you actually purchase it. And what the mission, y'all are never going to forget this, <laughs> the mission of the church, the mission of the people of God is to give others a taste, a preview, a glimpse of the goodness of God and what it looks like to live inside of his kingdom. And that's why Psalm 34, 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Right? And in the original Hebrew, what that means is that you are a spoon. No, it means that it is our privilege as followers of Jesus to live within the goodness of God's kingdom and to give other people a preview, a foretaste of what it looks like to live inside the goodness of the kingdom of God. That is the mission of the church. That is the mission of the people of God. And we've been talking about this very idea for the last five weeks in our series called Life on Mission. We've been talking about how we give our neighbors, the people that we work with, the people around us that might be far from God or disillusioned with the church, give them a foretaste, a glimpse into the kindness, the goodness of God. And today I know many of us, we, we travel during the summer months and I know there are many of you that are new to Grace Chapel. And so what I want to do first today is bring everybody up to speed on where we've been uh, throughout the summer and, uh, and what the Lord has been, been kind of sowing into us over the last several months into our community, and we're already seeing some enormous fruit, and it's been so encouraging for me and for our staff to hear all the ways that you all are pressing into living on mission throughout the week. So thank you for, for sending in those stories. They're absolutely incredible. So I'm going to spend a few minutes in review, and then we'll talk a little bit about what's coming up for us as a church family. And the reason why this is important for us to do from time to time, important for us to talk about, is Proverbs actually, there's a verse that says, without vision, the people perish. Or the message translation says it this way, I love this, Proverbs 29, 18, if people cannot see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves, but when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. And so we want to attend to, we want to be attuned to what God has been revealing, what he is revealing, and where he's leading us. But first, let's, let's do a bit of review. Back in April, we stated, based on what Jesus commands in the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, that we as a church family, that we are going to be about one single thing. There's a lot of great things that the church can do, a lot of great things that the church can be about, but there is one single thing that everything else we do is going to be aligned with, and that one single thing is this, that we are going to be a disciple-making church. We're going to be a church where we are committed to being disciples and where we are making disciples. And Matthew chapter 4, 19, Jesus gives us an invitation. He says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And if we're going to be a disciple-making church, we have to know what a disciple is, right? And a disciple, the way we've defined it, a disciple is someone that is following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and on mission with Jesus. 
or the, the, the shortened version, the shorthand is follow, change, mission. Follow, change, mission. We're following Jesus. We're allowing Jesus to change us and mold us and shape us into his image. And we are living on mission with Jesus. We're on the mission of Jesus and we're on that mission with Jesus. And I, I know for many of us, uh, and this is true of me, I didn't come to Jesus through a church service. I didn't come to Jesus through an altar call. I came to Jesus because there was a couple of people who were following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and living on mission with Jesus who invited me to join them on that journey. And I surrendered my life to Jesus in that process, and then I stepped foot in a church for the first time. And in fact, it was this church almost 20 years ago. I came to know Jesus because a couple of people were serious about being disciples and making disciples, and they engaged relationally with me before I ever would have stepped foot in a church, right? And so that, that's true for many of us as we think about how we came to Christ. Oftentimes, it's born out of a relationship, not necessarily uh, attend, just randomly deciding to attend a church service on a Sunday morning, although that is true for some of us. And so throughout the summer, in all three of our summer sermon series, this is exactly what we've been talking about, follow, change, mission. So we've talked about the gospel-centered life. It's all about following Jesus. Right? It's about centering your life on the beauty, the goodness of the gospel, of everything that God has done from creation. He created us to be in relationship with him. That's because God is good and he wants to share himself with us. And then we divided that relationship. We separated ourselves from him. Then Jesus came down. He lived a perfect life in our place. He died a death that we should have died because of sin. He became sin. He knew no sin. He became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. So it's creation, then his offering of salvation, and then the goodness of our ultimate redemption at the return of Christ. That is the gospel. Everything that God has done is good and beautiful and right, and he invites us into that story. That's the gospel-centered life. And we talked about the transformed life, and Pastor Dave Buring did such a fantastic job talking about how we are changed to actually become like Jesus. How do we grow to become like Jesus? And then we, uh, for the last five weeks, we've talked about life on mission. The call of the Christian is to participate in the mission of God in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in our campuses, in our school, in our communities. And so all these seeds that we've been sowing over the last few months and that we'll continue to sow long into the future are all aligned with and, and pointing us toward becoming a disciple-making church in Middle Tennessee that's bringing the life of Jesus to individuals, to communities, to nations all around the world. That's what we're about, right? And so if, if you're new to Grace Chapel, you're going, what is this church all about? That's what we're about. All right, and so we've been pressing toward this and we will continue to long into the future. Let's talk about where we are and uh, where we are headed. We've said this in different ways before, uh, this idea that we will become what we believe. What we believe informs and shapes uh, uh, how we live. Uh, Beth Broom writes about the fact that our beliefs are the foundation of our lives. And if we, if we build, on, uh, build a home that is on a foundation that is faulty, as we build on that home, the home is going to be tilted, it's going to be askew, and the same thing is true with our lives. We were just singing, I'll build my life on you, Jesus, on you alone. You are a firm foundation. And in fact, John Mark Comer says this, he says, we become what we believe for better or for worse. And in the knowledge of the holy, A.W. Tozer writes this, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What you believe about God, what you believe about yourself, what you believe about the world, what you believe about others is radically important and it shapes who you become, 
right? And, and all of these different quotes and all of these ideas are reiterating what Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 7, where he contrasts those who build their, their houses on the rock and those who build their house on the sand. And when the storms come, one is going to fall and the other is going to remain. And, and it's all about your belief, your orthodoxy, your belief, and your practice, orthopraxy, right? So belief and practice. And whether or not you're putting into practice the things that Jesus has commanded, that is the thing that makes the difference. We've said this before. The American church is not suffering for lack of information. The American church is suffering for lack of application, for actually living out the commands of Jesus. And so it's about your belief and your practice. And so I want to give you, uh, as we move forward together, I want to give you three foundational pillars that this church is built upon and will continue to be built upon long into the future. So three foundational pillars. I want you to remember these. I want you to hold on to these. And these three beliefs, they inform how we function how we make decisions, what we prioritize, how we engage in relationship with one another, how we engage in relationship with those that are outside of the body of Christ, how we live out and practice the ways of Jesus in our lives, in in a broken, lost, and hurting world. So the first one is this. We believe that the gospel changes everything. Not some things. Not most things. The gospel changes everything because the gospel is not just some spiritual transaction that you have when you give your life to Jesus. The gospel is every good thing that God has done from creation to salvation to our ultimate redemption, right? It's every single thing that God has done. It's not ethereal. It's incredibly practical because the gospel is the thing that frees you from your need to justify yourself. It it is the thing that frees you from feelings of inferiority and insecurity because the gospel tells this person you are more loved than you could possibly ever imagine. God sees you, he knows your name, and he chose you to be a part of his family. So it, it, it delivers you from feelings of inferiority and... It delivers you from feelings of superiority because the gospel tells you that your sin was so great, yes, yours was so great that it literally killed God, right? So it it humbles you. So it empowers you and humbles you at the very same time. The gospel changes everything about your life. The gospel delivers our hearts from all of the lies that we've believed about God, about ourselves, about other people. It is the news that brings great joy to all people. The gospel changes everything. This is why Jesus says in John chapter 10, verse 10, he says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what he does. He is set on destroying your life from stealing the things that God wants to impart into you, to bless you with, to lead you into all the good things. He wants to steal it from you. He wants to kill your life and he wants to destroy you. And then Jesus says, but I have come that they, that means us, may have life and have it to the full. That's the good news of the gospel. We have an enemy who is out to destroy us, but Jesus has come down to give us life to the full. That is the gospel, right? So uh, what I want to do, I want to give you some practical ways that we're, we have been and are going to continue to press into this. I want to give you some examples of, of ways that our church family is building upon this foundational pillar. And this list is not comprehensive, Um, So it's not everything that we're doing, but I I just want to give you some examples of how we're building on this. And as we talk through some of these things, and we're going to go fairly fast through these, if you are interested in any of the the classes or any of the groups that we're talking about, feel free to take out your phone and take a picture of the slides that are going to be up on the screen, or you can always visit the website at gracechapel.net, and almost everything we're talking about is going to be on there as well. 
So the very first thing, and this is radically important in our day and age, the very first thing, the way we're building on this foundational pillar is we are absolutely committed to gospel-centered preaching and teaching in every area of ministry across the church. We are going to preach the entire counsel of the word of God. We will not shy away from the hard topics just because they might be offensive or they might rub somebody the wrong way. And and let me just give you permission on something. If I or we, in any of the contexts across this church, if we begin to depart from the gospel as it's revealed in the words of scripture, you have my permission to confront us, to challenge us, to bring it to our attention. And if we refuse to listen, run. And this, this is what I like to call theological generosity, okay? So the, the things that are black and white in Scripture, the essentials, we hold with a closed fist. And the things that are gray areas that have been debated in church for 2,000 years, there is room for diversity of belief among those things, right? So the things that are black and white, we will not negotiate on those things. But on these things, there's room for diversity. So... If you say, well, I come from a Church of Christ background, or I come from a Catholic background, or I come from a no church background, there is room for you here, okay? And just know we're going to preach the whole gospel, okay? All right, so another way that we're building on this foundational pillar is in our life groups. What we want everybody to do, you you can only get so far by sitting in rows for one hour once a week. And so what we want to encourage everybody to do is get in circles, get in groups where you can discuss how you are practically applying what we talk about here on Sunday mornings. How you can help one another press into following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and living on mission With Jesus. We want people to learn together, to grow together, to build relationship with one another, and have a support for one another whenever hard times come. And and we're we're taking these things and we're figuring out how the gospel applies to everyday life. And it's life changing, but you've got to get in community with other people that know you and that you know, people that will encourage you and challenge you, and people that you can encourage and challenge as well. So life groups is a way that we live this out. Another thing that we're gonna be doing starting uh, in October, uh, and this is, this is going to be something that we sort of intersperse throughout our, our life as a church, is we're gonna, we're gonna start something called Crucial Conversations. And what we're doing is we're looking at how the gospel infiltrates and informs and helps us navigate the incredibly complex issues that, is fa- that are facing our world today. So for example, uh, a couple of weeks ago I mentioned a man named Walt Heyer, right? And he's gonna be joining us toward the end of October and we're gonna have an interview with him on a Sunday morning and then there's gonna be opportunity for Q&A as he talks about issues surrounding gender identity and how the gospel informs how we navigate some of these incredibly complex and difficult issues in the world, right? So Walt is gonna be joining us. Also, uh, Shadonke Johnson, who's from Sierra Leone. He is, um, man, he is passionate about disciple making, and I'm telling you, this guy has, he has more faith for the American church than anybody I've ever met. And so he's gonna come share with us about his hope for the American church. He believes that the best days for the American church is ahead of us and not behind us. That the church is being refined right now. That we're becoming clearer on what we ought to be about, on what the mission of Jesus actually is. And so he's gonna challenge us. And again, there's gonna be room for some Q&A with him as well. We're also gonna be talking about the dangers of progressive Christianity and some of the, the, the beliefs out in our culture that are beginning to infiltrate the American church. And so again, we're gonna be talking about some of these difficult issues and that's gonna be called Crucial Conversations where we bring people in, we do some interviews and we ask them to give us their expertise, their wisdom on some of these issues. So you can look forward to some of that. We'll keep you posted on those things as well. The other thing we're doing, we are, and I love this so much, 
We are partnering with other pastors and other area churches to further the kingdom of God in Williamson County. You know, one, one of the things that uh, uh, when we planted the church out in Washington State, um, one of the things that, that became evidently clear to me is that if churches did not work together out there, they would not survive. And so one of the things that we're, we're pressing into here is connecting with other pastors and seeing how our congregations might be able to link arms with one another and work together to further the gospel, to serve our community, and further the kingdom of God in our county. And, and here's the deal. If the gospel changes everything, which it does, then there is absolutely zero reason for the church to be competitive or territorial with other churches. Right, and so we're pressing into this. We're, we're linking arms with other churches. The other day I grabbed lunch with uh, Randy Loveless, who is uh, the pastor over at Christ Community Church. And uh, we, we ended up talking about what we, what we sense the Lord is doing in the American church. And I'm telling you, the Lord is speaking almost the exact same thing to him as he is to us. A and there's another meeting with uh, other area pastors where we're going to get together. We're going to talk about this very same thing. And here's the deal. When we come together, I'm telling you guys, this is so great. W we come together and there's no agenda other than we want to know each other, love each other, support each other, and figure out what God wants us to do together. And we are praying for each other's churches that God would bless them, grow them, that we'd all be able to reach more people for the kingdom of God. We're celebrating the successes of other churches. So there's that. We're partnering with pastors in other area churches. Also, we've got worship nights on the books that are going to be re restarting here soon. So September 7th, we're going to have our, our first worship night of the season. And we're looking at ways where we can partner with other area churches to do worship nights together to represent the unity of the church in Williamson County. Also, we've got corporate prayer nights on the books. We've got a night of healing that's scheduled for November 8th. And Pastor Rick and the team are going to be putting these on the books. They'll be once a quarter. So we're going to get a, on a regular rhythm as far as uh, coming together as the family of God and seeking God's face together and praying for one another. And we're doing all of this because the gospel is not just something you believe when you first come to Christ. It is the whole story of everything that God has done, and it affects every single aspect of our lives and every single aspect of our church, every single aspect of our community, because we believe the gospel changes everything. Next, we believe, this is the second foundational pillar, we believe that discipleship is the process the process for what, you ask? Discipleship is the process by which we become like Jesus. Right? It, it's not just being discipled. Because many of us would say, well, I've never really been discipled. Okay? It, it's, it's not just being discipled that makes us like Jesus. It's also making disciples that makes us like Jesus. And you might hear that and think, well, Rob, I, can I become like Jesus? I'm just a human. He's God in human flesh. I'm just a dude. <laughs> I'm just a person. Right? How in the world can I become like Jesus? And to be clear, we are not saying that you can be Jesus. Okay, there's only one of those. All right? <laughs> but you can be. And in fact, it's God's will and his desire that you become like him. Right? In fact, I... Don't take my word for it. I want you to see this. Luke 6, 40. Students are not above their teacher, but all who are fully trained will be what? Like their teacher. That seems to say that you can be like Jesus. Romans 8, 29. For God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become what? Like his son. You can be like Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3.18, and the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. Ephesians 4.13, until we all become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Did you know you could attain the whole measure of the fullness of Christ? 
Yeah, okay. Colossians 1.28. So that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. And this one is my favorite. 1 John 2.6. Whoever, just say whoever. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. You know, God wouldn't command it if it weren't possible. He would not command it just to frustrate us and give us an unattainable goal, right? Jesus commands it, scripture commands it because it is possible, right? The Christian life is about being formed, being molded into the image of Christ over time growing to spiritual maturity and helping one another do that as we all become like him. But there is a severe problem in the American church today. And that problem is this. Too many of us are more formed by the 24-hour news cycle than we are by the person of Jesus. We are more formed by our allegiance to whatever political agenda we adhere to than we are to the scriptures. We are more, uh, our allegiance is more aligned with Fox News or MSNBC or whatever it is than it is to the person of Jesus. And it's time for the American church to get centered back on the thing that is the main thing, and it's following Jesus. In fact, Dallas Willard once observed that one of the most significant issues of our time was whether people who identified as Christian would actually become apprentices, students, and disciples of the way of Jesus, or if we would just settle for cultural Christianity, which is having the guise of religion with no ongoing allegiance or commitment to Christ and his kingdom. Rich Velota said this, the troubling reality is that believers can be deeply committed to being Christian without ever being deeply formed by Christ. This is why Jesus called us to be disciples that make disciples so that we might engage in community with other people that are helping us as we're helping them move more and more toward becoming like Jesus. And listen, it's not just what would Jesus do. It's not just doing the things that Jesus did. It's thinking the thoughts that Jesus thought. It's feelings, feel, feeling the things that Jesus felt. It's having the motives that Jesus had, right? It, it's not just limited to doing, it's being like Jesus. It's carrying the, the compassion and the courage that Jesus carried. It's having the mercy and, and the forgiveness and the grace that Jesus carried and the kindness, the goodness that he carried all throughout his life. It's being like Jesus, not just doing what Jesus did, even though that's a part of it. Bill Hull wrote this. He says, in order to grow in Christ's likeness, you'll also need to be a part of a community that offers you grace, particularly when you stumble and fall. And he says, to offer grace means treating others better than they deserve to be treated. It means looking past faults to give others our praise and support. If our aim is to help one another become like Jesus, there will be grace to try and fail and try again. There will be grace to make mistakes and to learn from those mistakes. See, we don't view mistakes as, as, a, as, a, as a death sentence. We view them as stepping stones. We're failing forward, right? We're learning as we try and fail and grow. That's how we learn. That's how we grow. That's how we become more like Jesus. And in the midst of that, there is going to be grace and support and accountability and guidance and incredible camaraderie as brothers and sisters in Christ as we press toward maturity in Christ together, right? That's what we want to see happen because I'm telling you, the world does not need country club Christians. The world doesn't need Christians that are more committed to a fear-mongering news cycle than they are to the ways of Jesus. What the world needs is people that are following Jesus genuinely, following Jesus. They got their eyes on Jesus. They're becoming like Jesus and living on mission with 
Jesus. Because the world needs people that are deeply committed and being formed, molded, fashioned into the image of Christ, living out and practicing the ways of Jesus. That is God's desire for every single one of us. So here are some ways that we're building upon that foundational pillar in our church. Some examples of this. In our women's ministry, there are currently 20 uh, women's mentoring and discipleship groups that are in a year-long program, and that is going to kick back up in January 2023, and you can actually, if you're interested in jumping in on that, you can apply on uh, the women's ministry page on our website to be a part of those discipling groups that are, that are meeting and have been meeting and will continue to meet long into our future. There's also going to be prayer groups, uh, women's prayer groups that start up in in homes and in coffee shops and restaurants here on our campus. There's gonna be women that are gathering together for the purpose of prayer and seeking the face of Jesus together. So there's women's discipleship groups that you can be involved in. Also, in our men's ministry, there are uh, certain men-only life groups where discipleship is happening. There's also discipleship groups that are happening uh, with uh, Pastor Dave Buring's book, The Discipleship Journey, where men, small groups of men, are helping each other become uh, more and more like Jesus uh, in the process of building relationship with one another because discipleship happens within the context of relationship. So you can't be isolated and be discipled and make disciples. You gotta be in relationship with other people in order for that to happen, and that's happening in a whole variety of ways in our, both our men's and women's ministry. Also, our adult, adult equipping classes that are gonna be kicking back up. We've got our welcome class. If you're new to Grace Chapel, this is a great way to learn about who we are and what we're all about, which is sort of what we're talking about today. Uh, there's also our connect class. So if you're looking to get connected in any of these discipling groups or connected with other people that are new to the family of God here, it's a great way to do that. And then if you wanna go a little bit deeper, we've got our disciple class where you're gonna learn things like how to hear the voice of God. Right and how to follow the ways of Jesus in a variety of ways. So there's equipping classes. There's all kinds of other equipping classes. There's total transformation, uh, another way to become like Jesus, and they're all listed on our website. So our equipping classes are there as well. Also, in our marriage and parenting classes, we're exploring how the gospel infiltrates your marriage as you are being discipled and discipling one another in your marriage as well as discipling your own children. Because discipleship, it begins in the home, right? If we're not doing that in the home, we're not gonna be able to do that out in the world. So it starts in the home. This is a great way to press into that together. Also, Pastor Jimmy let me know that starting in September, there's going to be an opportunity if you're new to Grace Chapel. We've got new groups for new people. So uh, it's not gonna meet in a home. It's gonna meet here on our campus where you can meet other people that are new to Grace Chapel and you can press into relationship with them. And who knows what God will do through that, but you can disciple one another as you're connecting here in the body of Christ. So new groups for new people are coming up. Also, and again, this list is not comprehensive. We're just trying to give you guys some ways that we're pressing into these foundational pillars together. Uh, I, I'm so proud of uh, Caleb James in our young adults community. One of the many things. <laughs> apparently, I'm not the only one. Um, <clears throat> one of the ways that they're pressing into discipleship is Caleb has established a teaching team where he is developing and raising up the next generation of preachers, of teachers, of ministry leaders, and, uh, and, and they're refining one another. And if you're here and you're a young adult, you haven't yet connected with the young adult community, I know they would love to meet you and help you begin to build some relationship. They meet every Friday night in the barn. And uh, if, if you're a young adult, it might be the best thing we got going. So go, go join them in that, it's awesome. Um, and the other thing, just to add on to this, as, as Caleb is, is, is investing in the next generation of preachers, teachers, and leaders, I'm believing and I'm praying that the people that he is investing in and raising up are gonna be our future church planters, ministry leaders that we send out into the world. Yeah. Okay, next. Uh, next Sunday, we are kicking off a new series called Disciplines of a Disciple. 
And we're gonna be talking about the spiritual disciplines and practices of believers for the last 2,000 years, the rhythms of discipleship that will aid us in being disciples that make disciples. And, and uh, back in April, when we first began to kind of talk about vision and where we're heading as a church family, one of the things that we talked about was membership. And as we engaged in conversation with you and, and with our staff, just asking questions and listening and, and praying and exploring, God, what are you doing? What do you want to do with this? What does this look like? One of the things that became evidently clear and that we sensed uh, God saying to us is that God is not asking us to become members of a club, but that God is calling all of us, myself included, our staff included, to move toward an annual covenant commitment to discipleship. It's not about membership to a local church. It's about all of us collectively committing to moving more and more toward being disciples and making disciples in a way that we haven't done before. So there's gonna be more about this. We're gonna talk more about this in this next series. But at the end of the series, we're gonna have an opportunity collectively. We're gonna give you an opportunity to actually read through some of the practices of what it means to be a disciple and make disciples. And you're gonna have an opportunity to sign a covenant commitment to discipleship regardless of what local church you participate in. Okay? So we're, we're, again, the goal is to become more like Jesus through being discipled and making disciples and we're putting incredible intentionality on how we're gonna do that as a family together. All right? So we'll talk more about that in weeks to come. All right, so the gospel changes everything. Discipleship is the process by which we become like Jesus. And the last one is this. We believe that everyone owns the mission. Everyone owns the mission. And we've been talking about this over the last five or six weeks. I want to read this quote from J.D. Greer. He says this. Churches that want to prevail against the gates of hell must learn to see themselves like aircraft carriers not like battleships, and certainly not like cruise liners. Members need to learn to share the gospel without the help of the pastor. Out in the community and start ministries and Bible studies, even churches in places without them. This is gold right here. Churches must become discipleship factories, sending agencies that equip their members to take the battle to the enemy. Everyone owns the mission. Every follower, every disciple takes ownership of how they will live on mission with Jesus out in the community. In fact, we have a a beautiful example of of a family doing this in the house today. And in fact, I want you to hear from our dear friends that are in town. Uh, Pastor Brian and Rochelle, are you guys in the house this morning? Where are you at? There you are. You guys welcome them to the stage. What's up, buddy? Hey, Rochelle, how are you? So good to see you guys. So for those of you that don't know Brian and Rochelle, they are the pastors of Grace Chapel, Navajoa. And so we wanted you to hear a little bit from them about their process and what it was like as they were sensing God's call to go and, uh, and sort of what God has done since then. So, so give us, for those of us that don't know you and don't know the story, give us, give us some of that journey, how God called you there in the first place. It started with me when I was fresh out of college. Went on a mission trip to Mexico, fell in love with the people, the culture, God put that in my heart. Um, Ended up going back down there with Pastor Steve and my, and my father mm. uh, and ended up at her ranch with her family where they were doing missions for 30 years. So um, Rancho Maranatha, yeah? yeah? Rancho Maranatha. Yep. So went down there for six months, ended up staying four years and got a wife and two, two kids out of it. <laughs> 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 and that's, and that's, that's where she comes in. I mean, we, we, when our boys were born, um, they were born prematurely and we came back mm-hmm. here in an emergency situation In our hearts and in our minds, we were doing God's work on mission. We were going to be there forever. Mm. God called us back here, Mm -hmm. miraculously. Had us here for eight years. Um, And so when we decided to go back six years ago, 
Yeah, for her, that was easy. For you, for you what was that? That was easy. It was going back home. You're going home. But yeah. He brought me here to prepare me to go back, which I'm so thankful for. Mm. And listening to you speak about uh, being discipled and being equipped, like we needed that desperately and we still need it. And um, I, we thought we were great when we were there and equipped, but every time, like every day now, we realize how we're not and we mm. needed more and more. So we're very thankful for all the tools that we did get while we were here. That's awesome. Absolutely. That's awesome. So what were, as you guys were preparing to go back, I know you were going home, so it might have been a little bit different for you, but what were you feeling? What were you thinking? What were some of the things that were going through your heart and head as you were preparing to really go out on the mission field long term? I was thinking about this right now. Just as I, I mean, really, this sermon was kind of rehashing and reliving mm. our process of what God was doing in us here in our whole life. And, and that's, to me, that's when Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 went from a refrigerator magnet to, to real life. Mm. It was trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. Yeah. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Yeah. And that, that, that became our daily life, it, it, like I said. It's awesome. Went from the refrigerator to, I got a real life. Us. That's awesome. And, and God has directed our path. That's so, so good. Okay, so tell us a little bit about where things are at now in Navajoa. Yeah, we're, we're <laughs> where are we at? We, that picture right there. Um, this is, that's Pastor Myron, a bunch of guys that have come down. We've got a church. I mean, when we want, went down six years ago, we were meeting in a little house in a backyard. Um, now we've been able to, with the help of you guys, with the help of this church. I mean, we've been able to buy this property. That's Pastor Myron, and Pastor Joe down there doing a men's uh, meeting. Some good looking um, men right there. Yeah, yeah. But here it is. I mean, we've had groups wow. come down to build these benches, to build this roof. Um, and those are, that's our family right there. They're, they're meeting right now. Um, we miss them. Uh, but yeah. That's amazing. We've got a church, we've got a place. Um, families are growing and we've got a lot of, a lot of uh, right now a really good mix of people. Like we've got three Catholic families and, and Catholicism down there is way different, but three yeah. Catholic families that are just coming. We're loving on them, we're accepting them and, and um, we're excited to see what God's doing. That's awesome, yeah. that's awesome. But we've got, yeah, it's, God's moving. That's good. Um, okay, so for, for us in the room, um, how would you, challenge kind of just the everyday American Christian to press into living on mission? What would you, what would you say? What would you share? <laughs> well, we're, we are all called, and it's not if you want to. It's God really has work for us to do everywhere, and I know that I had to learn that I could be in the United States and actually be on mission, which I didn't think that I could before. Mm. I thought everyone here was good and we had the resources and the churches and um, I wasn't needed here. Mm. But really, the world is hurting and we are, every day we have people that come into our lives that are so broken and in Mexico, it's a little bit more obvious. You can't hide it as much as you can here, mm. but it's the same issues. And so God invites us to participate in what he's doing and it's an amazing thing. It's very humbling and it's overwhelming and we do run into situations where we truly do feel like it's a lost cause if we didn't know who Jesus is and yeah. what he can do. Yeah. So it's, it's an exciting adventure and it's fulfilling and humbling and overwhelming and it's the only way to live. Like you're missing out on so much until you decide to allow God to use you and be his hands and his feet and see people the way he sees them. It helps you have compassion for people who sometimes don't seem worthy of your compassion. So mm. um, the world is in need everywhere. Yeah. Yep. And so I, I've learned that wherever we are, God is calling us definitely to yeah. be on mission with him. Yeah. yeah. My, yeah. My, I think my challenge would be um, trust in the Lord with all your heart. <laughs> in all your ways, acknowledge him. Um, but I think my challenge would be take advantage of all these opportunities, these unbelievable opportunities that, that Pastor Rob has been telling you guys about. These groups, I mean, that's what changed my life. 
I said we had the privilege of sitting in this church and receiving unbelievably blessed teaching and, and Bible-based teaching, but what changed my life was being involved with, with other men, mm. those community things. So just please do that. Yeah. Like, like we're begging our people, do this. And we're starting small groups and we've got them going. And where we see true change is where people have committed to that. That's awesome. So that's my challenge is get to know people. That's good. Up in Mexico. That's good. <laughs> hey guys, can we thank Brian and Rochelle for the work they're doing? Yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you. Love you both. Yeah. So to reiterate, you don't have to travel to the other side of the world to live on mission, right? You, your own backyard is a mission field. Your neighborhood is a mission field. Your home is a mission field. Your church even is a mission field. If you're serving in kids' ministry, you are a missionary to those children, right? Your, your, your school is a mission field. Your workplace is a mission field. And for others of you, maybe... Uh, maybe God is calling you like he called Brian and Rochelle to go into a foreign land to represent Jesus there. And for us, for Misty and I, it was God sending us to uh, Bellingham, Washington, which was pretty much like being a missionary in a foreign land. <laughs> and and for, for Brian and Rochelle, it's them in Mexico. There's other people in our congregation that are being prepared to be sent out on mission overseas where they are, I mean, just incredible work being done with Jews and Palestinians and bringing reconciliation, introducing Jesus to where there has been animosity and division and there's, being, there, there's reconciliation happening where you might never expect it because people are obeying the call to live on mission. So it applies to every single one of us. And, and who knows what God is gonna do in your life, but it begins, as Brian and Rochelle said, it begins with faithful obedience to Jesus here and now and not leaning on your own understanding, but simply trusting in him, acknowledging him in all of your ways and allowing him to direct your paths. But some ways that we have been trying to help us press into this together is through our Four Wilco campaign, where we're simply creating easy ways to engage in conversation with people in the community, maybe people that know God that need some encouragement or people that are far from God. We also introduced our neighboring maps to help you press into getting to know your literal, not metaphoric, but your literal neighbors uh, and, and get to know them, what they care about, begin to pray for them and love them well. Also, I wanna let you know about this. This is, this is very important. So last fall, there's a... Uh, a volunteer-led ministry that got started called Grace Serves. Grace Serves, and it's a ministry that serves widows and single moms and the elderly. And so if you're here and you're saying, man, I would like to help with that ministry or I have some needs that I can't necessarily get to because of a condition or because I just can't get to it, email us at graceserves at gracechapel.net and we would love to either get you connected or to come and help you because this is what the church is for. This is why we exist and what we're about. Also, I wanna cast some vision around this for a second. I've had this belief for quite some time and it might be a little bit controversial. So uh, if, if you don't like what I have to say, just email brant at gracechapel.net. <laughs> This year, we are going to redeem Halloween. So what we're gonna do, I, I, I gotta tell you, there is no greater mission opportunity in the United States of America than on Halloween. What other night of the year does everybody decide collectively that they're gonna leave their houses and then go ring their neighbor's doorbells? What a great opportunity. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna set up what we're calling glow stations. So we're gonna partner with you or with your life group and we're gonna set up these stations in neighborhoods all across Williamson County where you can, if you wanna, I don't know, grill hot dogs or make s'mores or have hot chocolate and have glow sticks or whatever it is, just an opportunity where people can stop and actually engage with you in conversation and you can get to know your neighbors and love them well 
on Halloween. Thank you. So we're going to redeem Halloween this year, all right? And also, we're partnering with the city of Franklin to serve our community with Pumpkin Fest and with the Main Street Festival. We own a portion of these events in order to serve our community where we can rub shoulders with people that are far from God and show them the love of Jesus as we're living on mission together. We've got local partnerships that we're engaged with, with Chris and Elaine Whitney, with One Generation Away, with Hope Force International that's serving in Kentucky and other places. Where, where there's disaster relief that needs to happen, plenty of other partnerships. And then we've got our international partners with Brian and Rochelle in Mexico. We've got Josiah's house in the Dominican Republic, and they're gonna be here visiting in September. Incredible work being done there. We've got our partners with Lamuel in India, and then Haiti and South Sudan, all over the world. There is differences being made all over the place as we, Grace Chapel, are pressing into living on mission because we believe that the gospel changes everything, that discipleship is the process by which we become like Jesus, and every single person who is a part of the body of Christ owns the mission, takes responsibility for the mission of God in their own life. Because as we said at the very beginning, you and I are spoons. It is. It is our job to give people a foretaste, a glimpse, a preview of what it means to live within the goodness of the kingdom of God. We have the privilege to show other people God's kindness, his mercy, his love, his loving kindness that is better than life itself. We have the privilege of living that out in the world that we live in. This is who we are, this is where we're going, this is the foundation that everything else we do is gonna be built upon because we are a disciple-making church filled with people that are following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and on mission with Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm gonna pray for us and we're gonna celebrate a little bit. So, Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the clarity that you've given us as the body of Christ. Thank you for all of the incredible dreams and ideas that you've been feeding into our body through one another as we open our ears and listen, as we press into relationship with one another. And God, thank you. Thank you for all the things that you've done, all the things that you're doing, all the things that you will do. And we believe that the best days of the American church are ahead of us, not behind us. And yes, the, the waters might be treacherous, it might be more difficult than it's ever been in our culture. But God, your promise is not that life would be easy. Your promise is that even when life is hard, you will be with us. You'll never leave us. You'll never forsake us. And you are making us more and more like you. God, we cooperate with you to that end. Be glorified in us and through us individually and collectively. And right now, we just want to worship our hearts out. We want to sing as loud as we can to celebrate you, King Jesus, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship together.